whether to reopen a synagogue, how do we decide as individuals, how do we decide as a community. Um, and so I'm so glad to be joined here by Sean Brokos, who I um, have gotten to partner with, and I'm sure a number of you have as well. But Sean works at the Jewish Federation, and she has been there for, I want to say, almost two years. Is that correct? About a year and a half about a year and a half. Um, and so Sean is the public safety director at the, um, over at the Federation. And so, you know, the balance of our two skills, mine is a lot of um, communication, a lot in how do we approach decision-making also in anxiety and avoidance and function. Um, those are sort of where I come from. And then Sean comes to us from the FBI. She was working at the FBI for, I think, about 20 years. Um, prior to that was in banking. But but some of the, the areas that Sean specialized in the FBI was around supervision, um, being able to provide supervision, being able to do investigation for financial crimes, eventually violent crimes, and then also civil rights um, and uh, public corruption crimes. And through that has done a lot of different work on knowing danger, identifying danger, seeing danger, um, and also figuring out how do we balance decision-making in danger. And so that's sort of the framing of the conversation. Like I said, the, um, the everyone's on mute right now, but please feel free to use the chat, throw questions in there. Um, let us know if there's uh, thoughts or perspectives. I can unmute you and you're welcome to share it. We're happy for it to be interactive. Um, but mostly just because we made it public, I'd just like to make sure that it's on, um, that everybody's on mute for the safety purpose, since that's what we're talking about tonight. <laughs> um, okay, so what are our goals in this conversation, right? Our goals are to separate real threats from manufactured ones, to find balance, um, not so scared that we're making bad decisions, but not so oblivious that we aren't taking steps for, to protect ourselves. Um, and I know that that's a tall order <laughs> to do that in one hour. If I, if I, um, if we are successful, then what we will know at the end of this hour is what we don't know. So we can continue the conversation. We'll have at least enough shared knowledge that we'll know what we don't know, and we can continue the conversation going forward. And we want to feel confident in practicing conscious decision making. And so that will be something that Sean and I are going to be talking about tonight is um, what does conscious decision making look like? How do we bring that self-awareness to our decisions? And how do we recognize um, decisions as a chain of events, right? That it's not something that happens in a vacuum, that it's part of a, a bigger picture. So the um, sort of the fear, healthy decision making, and then back channeling is where we're talking. So fear. Um, I'm going to ask people to think about this for a second, right? What is fear? Uh, I, I gave a little bit of a hint here um, because anyone who's watched Inside Out, <laughs> um, you, can, uh, you can remember that in Inside Out, fear is one of our characters. Um, if you haven't seen Inside Out, I'll give a quick plug for it. It is a wonderful Pixar movie, probably from around 2013 or so. Uh, but what, what we sort of see in... in the Pixar movie, right, is that the quote from fear is that <laughs> I consider every day we don't die a success. And that's fear's job, right? Fear has a job, um, as does joy, and as does sadness, and as does other emotions. Um, but fear is the sort of primal fundamental piece of us. And it is so important um, because it has this very strong survival instinct. And um, we want to figure out how do we notice, how do we protect, how do we acknowledge fear, but also how do we not, how do we not let it be the only voice we can hear? Um, so the science behind what, what, what we've learned a little bit is that fear is something that the, that the neurobiologists actually are not totally in agreement on about whether or not it's a construct, whether it's an emotion, whether or not it's something that we can study. And interestingly, that when they've done studies, that fear is different for humans than it is for rodents or other typical um, case studies that, that, that the scientists like to do. Um, so, you know, when there's some biological factors to fear. We know about cortisol, we know about some of the firing in our brain, um, but what we don't know 
is exactly what the experience is, right? We don't always know. Um, and that one of the things is that, that we do know about fear about the brain is that it has a function of narrow vision because it's only vision is this very primal instinct. So fear helps us to stay alive in some ways through this very narrow vision. It shuts down a lot of our other functioning because fear wants us more than anything to just survive another day. Um, and so it doesn't often allow kind of that bigger picture. So, so, so in emotion, eh, you know, I, I think that overall what I read was that people are not 100% clear on whether it's an emotion and is it an alarm that should be heeded? Should we always listen to fear? Um, and the, there's pretty good agreement that the answer is no. Um, but that, that leaves a, um, a very murky area because the answer is no to that. But fear is successful if we don't die today. <laughs> then it's a little bit of a confusing, murky picture that we are, we are sort of um, painting here. Um, and I think that, you know, what I want you to really hold on to is that fear, fear has that tunnel vision effect. And we'll talk a little bit about that. That will be something that we keep coming back to. Um, so fear is gonna keep us alive, but only with a very narrow vision of how we see what's in front of us. All right, so uh, let me just reintroduce myself for those of you I haven't met. Like Maggie said, my name is Sean Brokos, and I'm the Director of Community Security for the Jewish Federation. And I am grateful to Maggie and the 1027 Healing Partnership for, uh, for this relationship. You know, Maggie and I both have very unique roles and we come together when it has to do with trauma and fear and resiliency. And I come at it from a background of law enforcement and first responders and the trauma that has been endured during, you know, multiple years of seeing um, some of the things that, you know, I'll just speak for myself. I saw during my career working violent crimes, work uh, kidnappings, um, and other violent crimes to include um, mass casualties and uh, things that are really difficult to process. So part of my role uh, at the FBI was to respond to those as a first responder, set up our crisis response, but also help people process those traumatic events. And before I took this job, I was actually, uh, I'm still working on my master's of professional counseling because my goal was to really help law enforcement deal with fear and to the point where it's not debilitating so that they can continue to function and make good decisions. And we have seen that in law enforcement where that has absolutely been a struggle. So I was headed that path and um, I ended up having some dialogue with the, uh, the folks at the Jewish Federation, and I'm, I'm thrilled that I ended up in this position. But when I first took this position, I thought, how do I go into a community that is reeling from trauma and go in and teach them about active threat and active shooters? Here I am going into a community that's experienced it, and I'm going to get up there and talk about this. How do I do it with the sensitivity and um, the due diligence that it deserves. So I partnered with Maggie right away and had those really important discussions. So that's just a little bit of my, uh, my background, but I was with the FBI for, for 24 years, the last um, eight of them here in Pittsburgh. And in January of 2020, I started at the Jewish Federation. I was there physically for about two months. And then, you know, as we all know, things, things came to a, uh, a screeching halt due to COVID. But, um, what, you know, like I said, this is a topic that is very important to me um, from a professional and a personal perspective because I've seen where um, it's, it's just a difficult topic and how do you best navigate through it. So when Maggie proposed this idea, I thought this is fantastic. This is a wonderful discussion for us to have and it ex it's extremely timely. So just talking about fear, um, as Maggie said, it is primal. It's a survival instinct. It has helped us, you know, from the early days, separate good from bad. How do we stay alive? How do we survive? But then the 
Second, if you look at that second bullet point, fear really requires two things, an awareness of the threat, but also, and here's the catch, a sense of being powerless to deal with that threat. So we can define fear, but that critical juncture is, do you feel powerless to be able to deal with that threat? And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight because we can, we can let fear guide us and we can let it guide us in a good way so that we can stay away from threats but we can't let us let it dictate our behavior to the fact where or to the point where we feel powerless. So that is something that we will keep going back to tonight during this, this conversation. And then the third aspect I really wanted to talk about as well is that we all have these file cabinets in our brain where we have stored away dangerous things. And I'll use the most, um, probably the most simplistic experience, but you know, the notion of touching a hot stove. We're taught early on that that's hot, you're going to burn yourself. So um, whether you've actually done it or not, you put that in your filing cabinet knowing I'm not going to touch a hot stove. Those are very much what we call adaptive techniques that help guide us and to make good decisions. Um, and we have some of these things that honestly are just inherent. These are things that we have, have been passed down inherently from, you know, generations and our ancestors that have, you know, that already exist to some extent in our filing cabinets. But where this gets harmful is when you process something um, that is, uh, that is what we call maladaptive, meaning it's not really a rational fear but yet it's getting filed in way in your brain as something that you believe to truly be fearful and that it's going to dictate your behavior. So we're gonna to talk too about this file cabinet that exists in our brain. There's good to it and there's, there's bad to it. So just trying to recognize how your brain processes some of these topics. So that's what that uh, last part is about. And I like your example of the hot stove and I was showing everybody I have a nice burn right now because oh. I clearly was not paying close enough attention. Um, but I like the idea of the hot stove because I think, you know, we, we say to kids all the time, ow hot, don't touch, ow hot, don't touch. Um, how much is already programmed to sort of already know that? And how much do we have to be taught? Do you know? I, I think it's certainly it's, uh, you know, there's a concept that fear is inherent and also that fear is a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. So when you are teaching your children, um, you know, ow, hot, don't do this, don't do this. That's a learned behavior. They haven't experienced that fear themselves because they haven't burned themselves. Um, so there's the distinction there that some of it is just a, a learned behavior and fear can very much be a, a learned behavior. Thank you. Um, all right, so, you know, the to go back, right, that fear considers every day that we're alive a success. So the question, right, what are the leading causes of preventable death in the U.S.? I'll give people a second to throw, throw your guesses into chat. No looking up the answers. I already know Janet's going to be a ringer on this, but <laughs> car accidents, bathroom falls, somebody who's worked with seniors. So car accidents, bathroom falls heart disease. Got some of them here, right? So um, obesity, smoking, hospital related infections, errors and environmental hazards. Car accidents actually are not one of the leading causes. Um, They're a little bit lower on that list. And I think, you know, the Obesity is a leading cause of death heart because of heart disease and a lot of the other health risks that can come from it. Um, so pollutants, environmental hazards, so, so our cars <laughs> um, are the fossil fuels we burn, right? A lot of those are actually the, the um, leading causes of preventable death. Um, so, you know, when we think about our fear, I want you to think a little bit about whether or not these are things that you've feared um, and then what are the most common fears that people have? If you just pulled people sort of family feud style, um, what would you think are some of the most common fears that people identify that they have? Heights, dying, yep. Cancer, yep. Sharks, <laughs> snakes. 
<laughs> two snakes there. Um, right. So, so a lot of our fears, social rejection, um, heights, airplanes, I think go in with the heights, bugs, snakes, and spiders, oddly enough, much more than, sh than sharks, which were in there, germs, diseases, COVID falls into the germs and diseases, um, and death, right? That, that fearing death is a pretty big catch-all, right? Because all these things are things that social rejection is something that people don't always think of, but we are pack animals naturally, right? We have a natural instinct to be able to survive with a pack. Um, and so social rejection is a potential for, for death also. But all of these are different natural inborn things that we have that often cause fear. And so I go back, you know, looking at these two lists and reconciling the things we're scared of. Are they the things that are most likely to cause to kill us? And, and it goes back, you know, the preventable question to what Sean was just saying about powerlessness, that the feeling powerless. We a lot of these are things that most of us feel some power over. And so it, we don't fear them as much. Right. We feel some power. We, we know there's a risk. We take a risk. Um, we don't fear them as much. Um, and then I think that, you know, the, the, the most common fears, a lot of these really go back to also that they're built in. Why would we be more scared of bugs, snakes, and spiders than a shark or a bear? And part of it is because we don't know which of those are dangerous, right? We don't know which bug, snake, or spider might be dangerous. And so we have a reaction of powerlessness because we don't know which ones might be the dangerous and which ones might not be. But I think to hold in our brains that if we know the things that we fear most are not the things that are most likely to be preventable um, when it comes to our own mortality, then how can we trust fear? How do we trust fear as sort of our guide? So we're talking exactly about that, this, you know, fear of bugs or snakes or spiders. And, you know, if you saw Maggie and I both responded, we both, uh, ironically enough, have a, an extreme fear of, of snakes. So how do you reconcile two forms of uh, fear? One has the data. What are the leading, leading causes of death, right? That is very rational. You know the data set, you can make informed decisions. So you have that type of fear versus more of the, um, I don't wanna say irrational fears because they are there to keep us protected. But you know, if we break it down, how many people die from a bug bite or a snake bite or spider bite, we can look at that data, but does that make the fear any worse? So how do we re really reconcile these two and what are the trade-offs? And that's where we wanna get to tonight. How can you best make an informed decision? You have to stop and look at your fear and say, what's the data behind this? Is this really something that is going to you know, cause death or cause significant injury? Or is this something that really more in my mind, I've made this more of, of what it is. So yes, it will certainly keep us alive. Having a fear of heights perhaps will keep you alive. You'll be much more cognizant not to go to high places. If so, you'll be very careful. But it also will interfere with your ability to function because you may not be able to go to the top of the Empire State Building, let's say, say and see that wonderful view of New York. So um, while a certain element of fear is healthy, are you able to still take that and make an informed decision? And then does it interfere with your ability to function? So when you talk about these various fears or threats that are out there, we do file them away in that filing cabinet. We try and make sense of them. But then what happens to the fears that are unknown? You don't have a good place in your filing cabinet for it. And it then starts to consume you and feels like a global, global danger, meaning you are on high alert all the time because there's, real, there's no real good place to file that away. There's nothing in your mind that can help reconcile it. So these are the things that will interfere with your functioning. Ultimately, the, you know, the, the breaking this down is, is fear going to dictate your ability to function? Are you going to stop going outside and gardening if you love gardening for fear of snakes? And so these are the critical junctures where we find ourselves at. And um, in, this can be really difficult, but that's where we talk about informed de decision-making. And we'll get to that because there's some really good tips and 
I don't want to say tips, but topics for discussions that may help you when you are at these, at these different crossroads. Ultimately, it's going to boil down to a calculated risk. And we all have calculated risks every single day when, uh, you know, when we leave our house. Um, but we're really talking about how it, will those risks interfere with your ability to function. And you know something we know after a mass violence event is that global danger alert, right? This this feeling that we all unfortunately had to experience here, and we heard people saying it on the news this week as well, which is, I didn't think it could happen here, and I never would have imagined. And that is when we go on, uh, you know, the, this global danger, right? Because we can't imagine, right? We can't imagine. And so what happens is that we then have to figure out how to understand it. And that takes a while. Maybe it takes, you know, forever. Maybe we never get there. But one of the goals is that we want to talk about these things because we do think that the more we're equipped with the tools to understand fear, the more we can at least file and understand safety and fear in a way that sort of gets that rational part that Sean was just talking about. Um, yeah. Doesn't, oh, there we go. All right, so I'm just going to spend a couple minutes talking, and this will be more from a you know personal professional perspective. But what do you do when fear starts dictating your behavior, and what does that look like? And the best example, um, I think, the most relatable example is for those who have children or loved ones. So if you don't have children, look at it from you know a, a loved one or somebody that you care for, and you know as as a parent or caregiver. You have, of course, these, you know, innate biological urges to protect your children at all cost, love them, protect them, keep them safe. I always tell them, I, my children are 15 and 14. If I could wrap them in bubble wrap, I would. And that would have saved us a couple trips to the emergency room with my son after several broken bones. But, you know, if we could do that, we absolutely would. So I could keep them safe at all costs. I could keep them, you know, within my purview at all times. I would not let them walk anywhere alone, um, you know, instill fear in them. Don't talk to anybody. Don't talk to strangers. It, it, but is that the right way to go? Am I making those decisions based in fear? And further, am I passing that fear down to my children so that they are not going to be able to make good decisions as they become uh, older and, and adults? Or you can go to the other side of the spectrum and say, you know what, nothing's going to happen. The, the kids should, should roam free. They should be, uh, you know, independent. They should be able to make their own decisions. This will prepare them as they grow later in life. And hey, we can't control what's happening. Um, and do they have the capacity to defend themselves? So you want to make sure that you know you have that you have this thought process, and you're able to straddle that fence. You want to, of course, keep your children safe, but you also then have to give them the ability to go out in the world. And what does that really look like? So that's what we're talking about at the, trying to make these types of decisions. Um, and I'll just share with you the decision-making process that, that I had even you know, as early as last Saturday night um, and how your decision, and I'll talk about that, but how my decision-making is very, very clouded by my previous experience in law enforcement. I spent several years reacting to um, uh, very unpleasant um, crime scenes and abductions and uh, dealing with child predators and kidnappings. Some of them resolved in a positive way, some did not. So I had all of those experiences in my filing cabinet when I had my children. And so it was very hard for me as a mother to balance my professional life with my personal life. And so I mentioned an experience I had last Saturday night. My daughter, who is 15, uh, babysits for the neighbors. They are literally a less than a mile away. They live down the street. Um, but I know the parents go out and they like to drink. And so I said, please let me just pick you up. I don't want them driving you home. I know it's just a mile, but it's never worth the risk. So when they get home at midnight, they're not going to be in a shape to drive. Let me come pick you up. So she went back to the family and said, hey, you don't have to take me home. My, my mom or my dad will come pick me up. And they said, that's okay. We've hired a car and a driver and that driver can take you home. So I'm thinking, okay, I've just dealt with one 
rational fear. I mean, I, the first time they drove her home, it was not a good experience. So, you know, the drinking and driving, I dealt with that, I think, very rationally. But now I'm terrified because there's a driver who I don't know in a car that I don't know that is literally going to be driving my 15-year-old daughter home. And I said to her, I said, I'm not okay with that. And so she had to go back to the family and say, my mom's not okay with that. And I, they, I'm sure they thought I'm uh, a, a bit crazy. Um, they said, this is a driver. We know this will be fine. And so we worked out a compromise and said, okay, to my daughter, as soon as you get in that car, you call us, you call us on the phone and you talk to us. And then we will know, obviously, when you're home safely, it is literally down the street. But that's where you are straddling the fence with very important decisions. One is a um, a rational fear. There is a fear that they, they will come home drunk, they will drive her home, and it will not be safe, right? Very rational. The fear of the driver taking her and abducting her, very irrational. That's based on all the years I had in law enforcement and the things I saw. So how do I walk through that decision-making process? And you know, my and my thoughts of feeling very helpless that if somebody takes her, what do I then do? So, you know, it's that dichotomy of being totally safe and being a helicopter mom versus tr uh, instilling trust in other people and trust in your children and also looking at the capacity. You know, could she handle herself? At 15, she could probably handle herself, but you don't know. Um, so these are things that where you're at crossroads really does, was fear dictating my decision that night? Not for the drive, the drinking and driving part, certainly not. But for the driver who uh, could possibly abduct her, yes, that was a reaction driven by fear. So just uh, sharing an example with you of how we all get to these crossroads every day in our lives. Well, and Sean, I think that that's a really good example for, you know, what this, the next quote that we had, right? The world is how you assess it. It's your belief about your agency that ultimately de determines your emotional outcomes. And so I think that, you know, Sean's example is so good for that, right? To think about what is the world, how Sean assessed it in that moment. Um, and, you know, you can hear the battle, you can hear those battles. And I think anybody, you know, has had those battles in their own head at other moments, right? What do I do in this moment? It's great that your 15 year old is babysitting. That's incredibly functional. She's getting out of a house in the middle of the pandemic and going somewhere. She also is earning, you know, money and, and self-efficacy. And the world as you assess it is that there's a lot of danger at midnight for her to arrive back home and you'd rather control it and have power over that by transporting her yourself. Um, and so I think that it was a really good example, right? So we can't control all the threats against us, but we can control our response to the threat. And that's really challenging. So we can't control the, the, the driver. We don't know who said driver is. The family wants to say that driver is a safe person that they trust. But the truth is that Sean's seen enough that for her, it's hard to trust that. That's not enough. Um, she's, not, she's not going on that. So we can't control that driver. Um, and so we can only control our response to that threat. And so for her, there was sort of this mitigating factor. I can, I can get my children. I can, I can do these pieces. Um, and I think that it's really important. Power control and masters of our domain is something that's important as animals, right? We want to feel some level of power and control and as though we have some ability to be the masters of our domain. And what we know is that that actually is really important for keeping us safe and it's not enough. It's, it's not enough fully, right? So we can do what we can to try and have some power and control and make good decisions. And there are times at which threats are there that we could have never predicted. Um, and so the, the, the challenge is that what do we do then, right? What do we do? We've done all the things we can to prevent. We've done all the things we can to avoid. Um, and we want to notice that attitude matters. The attitude with which we approach it matters. And so, so to be able to walk ourselves through it with full conscious mind, instead of saying, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, there's a snake. I'm going to be attacked. This is going to be terrible. Um, we want to notice what our attitude is. Um, if our attitude is, oh gosh, this is going to be terrible, then it's really difficult because the world we assessed in front of us was one that was not safe to live in. Um, whereas if we can assess that the world is overall safe with some threats out there that we want to avoid, um, then we can change the way that we, that we 
look at things. And so this idea that fear is an intervening variable between the sets of context de dependent stimuli. So fear is here, and that's actually true with all emotions, right? Um, joy, sadness. I can't tell you what you will experience when there's a context dependent stimuli, when the sun is setting, or you know, a good example is a context dependent stimuli being snow. Um, so, you know, what is the intervening variable between those context dependent stimuli? Snow, for me, brings this incredible peace and joy and happiness. That's my association. That's just what I feel. Barbara and I are going to go move to move to Alaska together, and um, you all can you all can come visit us. I see snow and I find clarity. I find, you know, cleanliness. Other people see snow and they think of shoveling. They think of their car. They think of, oh gosh, I'm going to be, you know, stuck inside or they've been in Pittsburgh too long and it becomes slushy. But what happens is that between some sort of stimuli, we have a way that we interpret it. And when we do that, we assign some sort of meaning, right? And so the, the, the truth is in the end of the day that, you know, the snow is not as important. The threat is not as important. It's how we assess it. How do we assess it? What is the attitude we bring to it? And what is our belief? And how do we notice, right? How do we notice? If I know that snow bothers me, then I can either choose to just every time be surprised and frustrated that it's here again, or I can say to myself, I'm going to stock up with the clothes that make me comfortable so that this year the snow doesn't get to to change my mood. It doesn't make me feel sadness. It doesn't make me feel defeated. Instead, I am empowered by that snow. Um, similarly with dangerous situations, right? How do we start to get the things we need so that we can have an intervening variable, right? We can have some ability to intervene to things that we don't always have power control over. Um, and for that reason, I also, you know, I, I wanna say when it comes to fear, you know, Sean and I had some really good conversations about this. Trusting our gut as the sole mediator between the stimuli and our response is dangerous. And trusting your gut is absolutely vital. So Sean and I will say later on, trust your gut. But, you know, you think about it a little bit. And so I am, if I trust my gut, I am scared of snakes. And that means I'm also scared of worms. And that also means that actually on TV, when I see them, I think that thing is just bad. And I turn away and my gut says, get out of here. Turn that movie off. Who wants to watch that? Am I safer? No, right? Have I limited something for a reason that didn't have any actual foundation in safety? Um, so with trusting our gut, we also want to notice that in, internally we have biological urges like we talked about with that file cabinet. So we have some urges for self-preservation and safety. So we want to notice, right? We want to know about ourselves. The snow example is a good one because what it does is it reminds you that snow is something that people can feel different ways about and will have different responses to. Same when it comes to open spaces or closed spaces. Same when it comes to sitting with your back to a space. You know, some people who want to see everything because that makes them feel safer. Some people who want to see nothing because they don't want to, they don't want that to be um, sort of, uh, they don't want to think about what could happen. There's all these different ways we respond and we have them internally that are sort of our process. If we know them, then we can then intervene with them. We can then make better decisions. And so, you know, trusting our gut is important. Trusting our gut as our sole um, answer is, is, a, is a challenge and we wanna watch that. So we want healthy decision-making, right? That's, that's the whole point. We want healthy, um, and I don't think we actually go into this, but the word healthy, healthy really is about balance because the only way to be healthy is to function. None of us are healthy if we're not functioning. We're not healthy in body. We're not health, healthy in spirit. And we're not healthy in mind um, if we are not functioning. And so healthy decision-making means that we want to be able to function and balance that. So, uh, you know, like I said, when, uh, when we started, this is a topic that really is uh, near and dear to me. And I, I have always been intrigued by people who have the ability to make the right decisions and be good decision makers. So, um, and we all know the people who just make very effective, timely decisions, and we know people who struggle with them. And so what is the distinction? Uh, 
you know, and is it something that's innate? Is it learned? Can it be learned? And one of the uh, best references I found was a book by Dr. Amanda Ripley, and it's called The Unthinkable, Who Survives? Um, I'm looking at it right now, Who Survives When Disaster Strikes? In, it's, uh, it's a study on whether it's nas natural disasters or mass casualties. So, um, and what does that look like? And the research goes, I mean, she goes very far back, but she spends a lot of time talking to folks who um, encountered and survived 9-11. And so she found the following commonalities that are there, and that is that they believe they can influence what will happen to them. And so really what that means is that sense of agency. So we talked about fear being fear itself, but fear rendering us powerless. And so they didn't have that second element of fear. They may have for a point, but they're able to get into a state of deliberation and believe that they can influence what will happen to them. So just a critical piece of that mindset. Um, the second commonality she found in all of her studies was that they find meaningful purpose in life's turmoil meaning that the things that are really difficult to process or struggles, they're able to say, to, to make some sense of it and to find some purpose that helps them as they move forward instead of inhibiting them as they try and move forward. And then similarly, they're convinced that they can learn from both good and bad experiences. So, you know, it doesn't mean that any of these folks are heroes at all. In fact, you know, one of the um, examples that she pointed out that I thought was fascinating was um, in 1982, there was a plane, um, a jet that crashed into the Potomac. And there were people on the bridge trying to figure out what had happened. And there was a, a man in his car on the bridge who had just come from his job as a laborer. He had steel toe boots, uh, boots on, heavy coats, doesn't think about it for a minute. He goes down, goes into the water, which uh, was full of ice, broken ice. And he starts running towards the people he saw there in an effort to save them. And he made it about halfway to them when help medics, a helicopter arrived to, to truly save them. But when those folks were interviewed, what they said really saved them was him. It was the hope that he provided. Did he physically save their lives? No. But did he give them the hope and the notion that help was on its way? Yes. And so when they were all interviewed, it was that one man's action, his deliberate action to jump in and try and save them. And the reason he couldn't get to them was the water was 36 degrees. And at some point you lose muscle functioning. It was all he could do to then keep himself alive. But just a very interesting study in why people make decisions and, uh, and how they react in these type of um, traumatic events. So just a good example, I thought, and the book is something where if you are struggling with, um, with fear and trying to make effective decisions, it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Um, it's something in law enforcement, I think that, uh, you know, that everybody should read. So those were my major takeaways from those books, but ultimately it comes back to agency and empowerment and we can make good effective decisions. They may not be easy, but we can make them with that sense of empowerment. Um, Lauren, okay. I'm going to do this. Um, I can also send you the link, but it is called, the book is titled The Unthinkable, Who Survives When Disaster Strikes and Why? And it's written by Amanda Ripley. And I will uh, let you know, I think it was written back in 2008. It's a bit dated in terms of looking at um, more current events, but the, the, the thoughts and the takeaways are, are relevant no matter um, what time frame you're looking at. So, so here's the book and I'm happy to uh, email the link or send out the link. Well, I think Tanya's point is also a really important one that there's a, there's another example, Tanya, also in that same book about um, during Katrina and there was a sound of a, a cat that was trapped under the house yeah. and this guy who his whole family ended up surviving, but he, or this is before Katrina, it was a different storm, but he cut a hole in the floor so that the cat could come out. And the point of it was that if the cat continued to make the distressing sound, the whole family would feel stressed. And he realized it wasn't necessarily about saving the cat. It was about that, 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 that he needed to ensure that his family stayed calm 
and found hope. And so I think upstanders can help with, with finding hope. I think there's lots of different areas, but hope matters as a mediating factor um, when there is some level of disaster. And that's why actually in fear, a lot of us can't process what danger is actually there because it allows us to keep hope. Um, and so, you know, I think that that is a, a piece that we'll talk a little bit more about, but I think um, people, when we find ourselves in a dangerous situation, being someone who can instill hope, remembering that hope matters, um, and it's not false hope, it's just giving those little pieces that, that somebody sees you, that you're not, you're not alone. Uh, there's a question. Would you say that other people's perceived fearlessness helps others? Other people's perceived fearlessness. Um. That's a really good question. And I think for the helpers out there, for the people who are born helpers, I think that gives them a sense of purposeness because they're going to, the helpers are going to run to those, um, you know, who, who are more fearful. So I think for the helpers, it helps others, but for those who are, are not, and that you know, it's not a judgment. It's just, you know, something that I think, um, you know, is a, is a bit innate. Um, I think that creates anxiety. So when you are next to somebody who, uh, who is, you know, is, is uh, racked with fear and doesn't know how to act, that can create further anxiety with, with you. Um, so I think it really, um, you know, it can go both ways just depending on, on the situation. Um, I think more importantly though, looking at an individual who, uh, you know, who does, is full of fear and doesn't know how to act. I think it's, um, you know, being able to help them and walk them through it is, is very important. But I think talking to them after the fact and learning more about what they have to say, uh, because I think, you know, it, it's, a, it's very difficult. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we need to find guideposts. The, the, the balance that we talked about, fear is going to keep us alive. Taking risks will help us function at our best. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll encourage everyone to take a second to sit and look at this picture. Um, this is a, a gentleman named Alex Hanhold, who if nobody's seen the, he has um, a movie called Free something, Free, um, yeah, yes. Um, and so here he is, you can notice there's no ropes holding him free solo. Um, and I want you to take a second to notice what your feeling is when you look at him. So he's taking risks. Um, and um, we all have to question why fear <laughs> allows him to take that kind of risk. Um, so finding that right level of risk is really difficult. Um, don't follow Alex Hanhol. Do not do what he does. Um, that is not going to keep you alive. That will make that fear part in your brain from inside out get really mad at you. Um, you want to get smart about risk. You want to know calculated risk and you want to figure out who are the guideposts, right? Who do we look to? Um, and so you know, I will say that I look to Sean. <laughs> so when I think about what's safe and what's not safe, hey, Sean, you know, we want to do this program that's going to have 20 people on Forbes Avenue, but here's why we want to do it. And so what I do then is I can talk through with Sean, what are the risks? What are the benefits? Is it worth it? And she usually, as in my experience, says, never says don't do it, just sort of thinks about what we need to do to do that as safely as we can. But so we have to find guideposts because like I said before, you don't want to just trust your gut. And you also, right, do want to take some risk. You want to figure out how do you take some risk. So we need to know the data. We want to prepare for risk and prepare for, um, prepare some more. We, there's never too much preparation you can do. And if you've watched Free Solo, he does a lot of preparing. Um, there is not, there is not sort of a, it's not haphazard, but he um, clearly does not, he feels calm. He describes this feeling of his breath slowing down and he feels calm when he is out there this far up. Um, and so, you know, to think a little bit about what scares us, what are the things that we avoid doing out of fear and are those things that we want to continue to avoid doing? Or are they things that we feel like there might be benefit? Um, 
you know, and again, the, the example of a snake, I'll go back to that, that it can really get in the way of my functioning. I, in fact, um, wanted to go to the Grand Canyon. My husband wanted to go to the Grand Canyon, but I only would go in the middle of winter because I was so scared of snakes that I figured it was the least chance we would see a snake. And um, I proceeded to break my ankle within three feet <laughs> on the ice. <laughs> and so we never got into the Grand Canyon. Um, so right, like the, all of the whole trip was designed around the fact that I really wanted to see the Grand Canyon and really didn't want to see the snakes. Um, so that is a risk that I probably was not thinking through fully logically. Um, my chance of being evacuated out for my broken ankle was very, very high. <laughs> the chance of a snake um, killing me very low. But I, um, I, I kind of went with my gut on it and planned this whole trip that then got canceled anyway. Um, we want to think about what is the balance? What of those things that we're avoiding um, are things that we would like to do or that, are, that, that really help us with our functioning? Um, So when it comes to making decisions, the really good news is, um, you know, there's, there's no right answers. There's many, there's multiple right answers, but the bad news is there are wrong answers and there are bad choices. So um, that's where this gets really hard because, you know, there are bad choices we can certainly make. Um, and, and I'll just share with you an example where to me, this really resonates. Um, part of my role with the FBI was leading the crisis negotiation team. And so, you know, most folks call it the, uh, the hostage negotiation team, but we were responsible for, uh, we would get call outs if it was a barricaded situation, a very, mostly a domestic, very rarely a true hostage situation, although we did um, certainly have some of those. And so a lot of the training we did was how do we handle this? And the number one rule was when you are dealing with whether it's a hostage taker or a person in crisis, and like I said, 95% of the time, it's the latter, it's a person in crisis. What do you say or what do you not say? And what you don't say is calm down. That is a bad decision. Universally, it's a bad decision. It's somewhat of an instinctual response because we still do it. We do it to one another. But the number one bad thing to say to a person in crisis is calm down. So, so much of our training was based around that. But the good news was we have a whole toolkit for helping somebody in trauma and crisis. And this is part of the decision making. We have what's called active listening skills and really being able to actively listen to somebody. You're not solving the problem. You're not having to make decisions for them. They, you are empowering them to make decisions. So you're having those discussions using active listening, maybe mirroring what they're saying or acknowledging what they're saying through a simple, uh-huh, I understand, I hear you. And so this, there's no magical right decision. If there were, we would have arrived on scene and gotten on the phone with the person in crisis and said, hey, all right, let's done. Let's get out of here. Let's wrap it up. I'm just going to tell you something to make this all go away. That will never happen. So there is not a magical answer, but there are wrong answers. And so that's something also to keep in mind when you're deliberating. Um, you know, the challenge is figuring out how to how do we sort through those and, and vet those out. So it comes down to really weighing back and forth. Um, and it's not easy, but we're going to now shift gears, I think, or at least soon we're going to shift gears. And how do we do that? What are the steps we can do to do that? Yep. Okay. So walking through, how do you really, you know, we've talked a lot about this, but now how do you do this? What have we learned? Yeah. So you really, you know, we'll, we'll, a lot of this will be somewhat familiar from some of the things we talked about. Make informed decisions, right? You want those to be informed by your own experiences and those of people you can trust, those guideposts. Don't make the decision Alex Hanhold does. Do make the decision Sean Brokos does. <laughs> um, sometimes, maybe yeah. not around snakes or sometimes not around parenting, but right. most... <laughs> <laughs> Mostly besides that, um, know who you can trust. Ask questions. You want to get smart about risks um, and you want to prepare for risks, right? Risks are not to be avoided. They're to be prepared for. We are not trying to have a life that is risk-free. We are trying to do the best we can to function with whatever known risks exist. Um, and so you want to make informed decisions with all of those. You really want to be a critical thinker. 
And you want to seek to remove some of the emotions out of decisions. So a critical thinker, we talked, to, we talked at the beginning about that tunnel vision. A critical thinker can notice when the tunnel vision is starting. You know, I only see this way out. Um, and they actually can stop, right? And say, I notice this. What might somebody else do? in this situation? Um, that's a critical thinking question sometimes, right? Is, is what would I tell somebody else to do? What would somebody else do in this? Um, and you, lo you learn to then back channel. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about that. Learn to find ways to both push the risk-taking thinking and safe decisions. And like Sean just said, right, that since there's no, the good news is that there's actually no right answers um, and there's a lot of bad answers. So you want in that back channeling to find for you what is the right level of risk and what is the right level of, um, of safety and how do, you, how do you navigate that? So these are just some helpful tips that, um, you know, when we were doing research, research for this that we came up with and also a lot through the book that I referenced earlier. You know, first and foremost, cultivating re resilience you know, I just noticed that should be uh, <laughs> resilience. So, and people, there are studies that people are just inherently resilient and that some are more so than others. And my belief and my, my lived experience is that this can be cultivated. This can be a learned behavior. So you may not feel resilient. You may feel at times where you're shaky, you're not sure what to do, but there are things you can do to cultivate that resistance. And that's planning, that's preparing, that's trying to learn more about your fears and um, get more comfortable with your fears and figure out what's driving them. So it is something that is possible. It can be cultivated. Um, and if anybody wants to talk further on that, I'm happy to do it because that's a lot of work I would do with law enforcement is really cultivating that resiliency because time after time you face trauma and then another trauma. And how do you sustain that? And how do you stay resilient? Um, Maggie mentioned goal, uh, guideposts. I think this is fantastic. Get to know your neighbors, um, you know, literally and figuratively. Learn who you can rely on. Have that short list in a time where you're at a crossroads and how do I decide who's that person you're going to call? And it may not be the same person for every decision, but I can tell you Saturday night when I wasn't sure what to do with uh, my daughter getting a ride home by a driver, you know, my guidepost was my husband, who is also in law enforcement, and he and I talked through this. So just having that one person, uh, you or several people you can talk to, have those guideposts. And if you don't have them, you know, try and find them, find who you can rely on. Um, breathing skills. This is something that is a, a very, very important and something that, um, you know, if, if you do yoga or thought about yoga, you probably will be able to relate to this. Breathing is so important when it comes to controlling your anxiety, which helps then control your thought process. So, you know, simple breathing techniques and just learning um, how those work and how you can best use those are, is something very helpful. And, um, you know, just walking away from before you make a decision and taking some deep breaths or working on breathing, getting healthy. And this is not just healthy in the sense of, hey, I need to lose five pounds. Getting healthy in the sense that your body feels strong. Your body and mind have that connection and you feel strong as a, um, as a unit. So it's more healthy in the term of holistically feeling healthy. Navigating calculated risks. I mean, they're out there every single day. How do you navigate them? How do you make informed decisions? And who do you look to to help you make those informed decisions? And then lastly, training your brain, muscle memory. You know, the more you do something that is really hard or frightening, the more you become, uh, it becomes second nature to you. Um, this is something, again, I go back to law enforcement. I mean, we train to arrest people at 6 a.m. going into a house where you've never been with a house full of people you've never seen. And we, we spend um, at, you know, at our training academy months and months preparing for this. How do you enter? Where do you stand at the door? Who's going to back you up? What do you do if uh, you can't see somebody's hands if they're holding a weapon? And I know this is a very sensitive topic. I'm only talking about my experience in the FBI and the training we went through. But I can tell you, we trained for months and months. By the time I actually did it, when I got to Newark in 1996, I was able to do it because it was all muscle memory. So just encountering something that, and it, it didn't mean it wasn't 
scary. Um, believe me, it was, I had a, a great amount of anxiety, but I also knew I had been trained for it and I had that muscle memory. So something to think about in just being able to train your brain with things that are complicated or fearful. And there's a good question. I, I'm curious about your answer. I have some thoughts. Do you find risk assessment to be more challenging for people who have had prior traumas, been through a, a mass violence? Oh, um, absolutely. Previous experience, um, help or hurt when you're making decisions and feeling in danger? Yes, that is a, a great question because certainly um, your ability to assess risk after you've been through trauma is very colored because what you have first and foremost dictating um, that thought process, that decision-making process is the most recent trauma you've encountered. And sometimes the best thing to do is to recognize that and to step back and say, right now, I'm at a place where I don't think I can make a good risk assessment. I can get back to that place, but right now I need guidance. And this is where you really should go to your guideposts because trying to navigate risk when you are doing it under the lens of trauma is a very, very difficult thing. And sometimes it can lead to bad decision making. So um, for folks who've been through that, it's really good to have those guideposts and people to lean on and to talk through decisions um, so that you don't make a, a decision that is, that it's, that's trauma based. And I think this goes a little bit to that file cabinet that we were talking about and remembering, right, that did we get to a place where we could file away that experience to a risk that makes sense or did we never get there? And there's not, there's not actually, you know, it's not good or bad. It is, it is what it is, but sometimes, you know, sometimes we feel really effective. There was a risk. We knew what we were doing. We felt like we got through it. Um, and sometimes because of the situation we were in, we didn't get to, to figure that piece out. And so where does that get filed in our brain? And that goes into that global threat period, right? That, that feeling that maybe there's more danger because I don't know how to make sense of what I experienced. I can't imagine how to file this away. Um, so I do think, you know, I, I think that's a good reference point for it because I think Sean's point is right. If, if it's a global threat alert system, then you wanna check that with somebody else. And okay. I think it's very important too that you don't lose confidence and faith in yourself and your ability to make decisions because people who have uh, endured trauma then start to second guess themselves and say, well, is this the right decision? And then, you know, there's a bit of paralysis that sit, sets in and you lose confidence and faith in yourself. And um, that's where just talking it through with others and then step-by-step step, making a good effective decision, getting some of that confidence back. And it's really a, a learning and relearning process. And I, I mean, that question right there, I think is a million dollar question. I think that is something that is really worth researching and talking more about because it affects every single one of us. Absolutely. It's our 201 version of yes. this class. <laughs> this is just 101. Right. Um, so I'm just going to really quickly um, go through this. And, and it was meant to be more of a discussion. We don't have time for it to be a discussion. But I do want to talk a little bit. It, this is kind of getting to that back channeling. So, um, so I used an example just because it was a real example. And some of you may relate to it or remember it. But in November of 2018, right, my high school junior, I don't have a high school junior, but if I did, somebody's high school junior is just getting um, back into classes after the shooting on October 27th. She sees on social media, there's a bomb threat at Alderdice and tells me she's not going to school. Um, so just as a real life sort of example, the question of how do we back channel, right? You're the parent, you have to figure out what to do in that moment. And what you're weighing is that you don't feel safe, that global threat response is going off, right? So your gut reaction is likely, yes, stay home, right? Um, there is this feeling that the world isn't safe right now. This world doesn't feel safe. Um, but so you wanna notice that gut response. You wanna slow down your thinking and breathing um, because the gut response is there doesn't mean we follow it. We hear it, we notice it, we slow down, right? We slow down through, I, I like, um, Tanya had given a good um, example that there are apps that can help us slow that down. Um, we slow it down um, and then we calculate the risk of going to school versus staying home. This is a really important part of back channeling. We look to those guideposts. We think about 
when we're back channeling, what is the risk of doing it versus not doing it? And there's always going to be risk in each of them. Um, phone a friend, so find, find somebody to bounce that off of. And then you create a plan for how to manage the risk associated with the decision you make. Because once you've done something like this, if you can back channel those decisions, remembering that after you've thought about that risk of going versus staying, of um, doing it versus not doing it, then the good part is you've already formulated what are the risks of going and then how do you manage those the best you can to, to regain that power, to not feel powerless in that way that we talked about earlier. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, I do, you know, open up the door that, that, that we might be able to continue this conversation. People who want to sort of um, go a little bit deeper to that question that Molly asked, which I think is a really important one specifically for our community. How do we understand what we come to the table with of past experiences of trauma? And how do we look at that with decisions? And then also this, this um, really practicing different ways that we can do this. I think there's a lot of opportunity for that. Um, but I also recognize that we we went over just a little bit um, and I could just talk with Sean all day. So <laughs> um, the, um, the, the references that she was saying, so the book is here, The Unthinkable Who Survives Disaster Strikes and Why. And then also this um, biology of fear is downloadable. Anybody who's curious, it's actually sort of a, it's a very comprehensive view of what we understand and know about fear in the brain. And so some of the references are from there. Um, but thank you so much. Um, thank you for coming and joining us. Thank you, Sean, so much for agreeing to do this with me. And we'll probably send you, I'm, I'm curious what what people took away and what they might want more of. So, so expect to see a survey, um, something where you can share a little bit of your perspective. We did record this. Um, so if there is something that you, someone or somewhere that you would like it to be shown again, then please let us know. Um, and, you know, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And I thank will um, unmute. Um, I don't know if I... If you, if you want to unmute to say goodbye, you're welcome. You're you regained that power. Bye. Bye. <laughs>